Welcome to the Trinity Reformed Church Podcast. Exhortation by Larson Hicks on March 14th, Lord's Day Service. Exhortation comes from a few passages in Luke chapter 12 and also Proverbs chapter 14. It's about how we invest our time and our careers. Let's start in Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. This passage is encouraging us to be wary of conventional, the conventional wisdom of our age. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. We should expect that there is common, there's a common, common standard narrative about how we should order our lives that seems right, but that it actually leads to death. I want to encourage you this morning to be especially skeptical of the common views today of education and career and family planning. The world has these things dead wrong. If the world can't tell the difference between a biological man and a biological woman, for instance, then do you think they really understand the difference between a path that leads to happiness or even what happiness is? They don't. It seems right to the world today that young people go to college, they get established in a career, they save a nest egg, and then once all of that is squared away, then and only then do you consider marriage and, and, and whether or not that fits into your plans and children. This view leads many to spend the first third of their lives preparing to fulfill the very first commandment that, we're, that humanity is given to be fruitful and to multiply. In many cases, we wait so long that you actually miss the biological window uh, to have kids naturally. And by the way, as I get older, the more I realize having little kids is a young man's game. <laughs> it's, it's difficult work. So don't wait. Um, there's a way that seems right to man, but it's in, uh, in, in the end it leads to death. So be skeptical of the ways of the world. They don't lead to life and flourishing. They lead to broken homes and broken marriages and death. So the next passage I want to consider is in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 16. And then he told them a parable. This is Jesus speaking. The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So what Jesus is saying here is don't wait until after you've made a pile of money to start doing kingdom work. Your soul may be required of you this very night. There's an organization, it reminds me of this, this organization that um, it's called the Halftime Institute. And it's a, it's, it's, you can look it up. It's, it, they focus on working primarily with CEOs and business executives who have spent the first half or, or really two-thirds of their lives fully focused on their career and on their business and who wake up one day and realize, I don't know if I've done anything worthwhile. I've just made a bunch of money. And so it's this, this whole institute that's designed to try to help people in that situation figure out, well, what do I do with the rest of my life? I want to do something meaningful with the rest of my life. Um, no criticism of the, of the institution, um, but, but it, it points to the fact that there is... There's a problem um, and, and a disordered uh, life uh, in, in a lot of these Christian CEOs um, if, if they're getting to that point in their life and they're having that realization for the first time. So in, verse, in our verse, God says to this man, fool, this night your very soul may be required of you and uh, the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I've heard co coaches in sports say things like, you know, leave it on the field. This idea at the end is, is that at the end of the game, you should have nothing left in the tank. You never at the end of the game want to, want to think, I could have worked harder. Um, if you lose, you want to lose because the other team was just better than you were and not because you have the heart, you know, to hustle all the way to the last whistle. So your coach wisely encourages you to leave it on the field, hold nothing back. Jesus continues in Luke 12, uh, again in, uh, in, in the same passage in verse 22. He continues, he says, he, he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. 
and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single day hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you so anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and drink and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. So what Jesus is saying here is, don't stress about money like the rest of the world does. God provides for his children, and stressing about money doesn't add a single day to your life. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness, and he'll take care of the rest. This is a hard concept for us to grasp, because our lives have become so compartmentalized these days into your professional life, your family life, and your, your church life, or your kingdom life. These things really ought to overlap and be integrated. So let's end with Proverbs 14.4, because all these things we're talking about kind of the plans of the world and talking about how we think about career and how we think about money. Um, Proverbs 14.4 says, where there, is no ox, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. So what does this have to do with anything? Um, it's similar to a, another saying, another common saying, if you want to make an omelet, you're going to have to break a few eggs. It's talking about perfectionism, and it's a serious enemy in the Christian life. Tidy, perfect plans are nice on paper, but if you actually want to produce abundant crops, you're going to need the strength of oxen. And those things, if you haven't seen them, are stinky, and they're messy. The passage says, where there is no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. It's a reminder that growth is messy. If you're interested in kingdom work, prepare to get dirty. This is a good reminder to us who are still in our first year of planting this church. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Or as G.K. Chesterton said, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. For a Christian husband and wife, raising godly children is the most important kingdom work there is. Families are the oxen in this metaphor of cultural transformation. Raising a family is messy business. But if we want a, har if we want a harvest of abundant crops in the culture around us, we'll need godly families that can do the heavy lifting of that work. So many churches will guilt their congregations into doing more door-to-door -door evangelism or witnessing to their coworkers. But they fail to focus on the people you'll, have, you'll absolutely have the biggest impact on in your entire lives, which are your, your spouse and your children. Pour yourselves into them. Witness to them. Make your home a delightful garden that nurtures strong, fruitful trees with deep roots. This is, in fact, the central promise that God makes to his people, going all the way back to God's promises to Adam and Eve and also to Abraham, the promise of godly offspring. God didn't put us on earth to live designer lifestyles of ease and comfort and wealth and tidiness. God's promise to give his people godly offspring and his promise that his glory shall cover the earth as waters cover the sea cannot be stopped if his people are faithful to be fruitful and multiply and to subdue the earth. The commandments are connected and obedience to them results in the fulfillment of God's promise of godly seed. So saints, be fruitful and multiply. With, and with your families, take dominion for the glory of God. Expand his kingdom and his lordship over every square inch of this planet, from your dinner table to your business. Turn from the ways of the world that seem right and towards God's ways that lead to life. Thanks for listening. If you want to find out more, check out our website at trinityreformedkirk.com. That's Trinity Reformed, K-I-R-K dot com. Oh.